celebrating a quarter century of Hi folks, I'm Joe, this is Same Name Different Game, and if you watched the last installment of SNDG Gaiden, you know that we're in another one of my multi-part series to celebrate the launch of a classic console. And this time, it's the PS1, and we are starting with the game that might be the most important first-party release of the system's first year in the West. So let's not waste any time and dive right in with a little history. I've said it before, and I'm saying it again now. 1995 was the year video games went mainstream. The widespread perception of video games progressed thus. In the 70s and early 80s, they were a fad. In the mid-80s and early 90s, they were children's toys. But in the mid-90s, they finally became for everyone. The Sony PlayStation ushered in a world where video games were as ubiquitous as film and television. The PS1 sold more units than the entire previous generation of home consoles combined, and became the highest selling home system of all time, until it was surpassed by its direct descendant, the PlayStation 2. As of this recording, the PS4 only recently surpassed the PS1, and the combined sales of current systems on the market far outperformed Sony's 1995 competitors. Whether it was pure genius, good timing, or most likely a combination of the two, 1995 and the original PlayStation are the tipping point. But how did that happen? Sony had dabbled in video games before. In fact, the first Sony published game in North America was Super Dodgeball, back when they went by CSG ImageSoft, which of course would later be changed to just Sony ImageSoft. And that label didn't have a great reputation with players of the era, routinely releasing subpar titles on the 16-bit platforms, but Sony was very much getting ready to make a bigger splash in gaming. They infamously approached Nintendo, and worked out a partnership to bring a Sega CD-style add-on, dubbed the Nintendo PlayStation, to market. This story is well known, but on the off chance you haven't heard it, Hiroshi Yamauchi, then CEO of Nintendo, reviewed the terms of the agreement on the eve of the public announcement, realized that Sony would get all the publishing rights to the CD titles, and left them at the altar, so to speak, instead announcing a partnership with Philips that would only serve to bear very odd fruit. What's lesser known is that prior to that, Sony also came close to a deal with Sega to have the two companies work together on what would eventually become the Saturn. According to Tom Kalinske in an interview with Sega16.com, I remember we had a document that Olaf and Mickey took to Sony that said they'd like to develop jointly the next hardware, the next game platform, with Sega. And here's what we think it ought to do. Sony apparently gave the green light to that. I took it to Sega of Japan, and told them that this was what we thought an ideal platform would be, at least from a US perspective, based on what we've learned from the Sega CD and our involvement with Sony and our own people. Sega said, not a chance. I've already spoken at length this year about how Sega dropped the ball with the Saturn. 
There's no need to revisit that, but basically after being rebuffed by the two biggest dogs in video games at the time, Ken Kutaragi and his team at Sony decided to sally forth on their own. And with folks like Olaf Olofsson on board, Sony had learned a lot about the gaming industry before jumping into the console race. They also had a massive company much larger than Sega or Nintendo bankrolling things. Sony's strategy was relatively simple. Price the system at $299 in North America, undercutting the Saturn by $100, bucks, and court as many publishers as possible, not only with the promise of optical media, which was cheaper to manufacture than the cartridges Nintendo was sticking with, but a sweeter deal on royalties than the other platform holders offered. And it paid dividends. Companies that had been in Nintendo's camp since the 8-bit days like Konami, Capcom, and Square all but abandoned the house that Mario built in favor of the home of the Walkman. To say nothing of Namco, who had issues with both Nintendo and Sega. But Sony was savvy enough to know that they also needed good first-party support. And that brings us to our first game for this episode, Twisted Metal. David Jaffe had a moment where he was one of the most visible game designers out there, a household name among game players. But in the last decade, his star has fallen somewhat. Still, his name is more recognizable now than it was in 1995. Jaffe got his start at Sony ImageSoft shortly after finishing film school, working as a tester on the North American release of Skyblazer for the Super NES, released in 1993. He quickly moved to game design and is credited as the designer for Mickey Mania, the timeless adventures of Mickey Mouse on the 16-bit platforms. And for his next game, he was given the opportunity to work with the brand new PS1 hardware on a game that would come out mere months after the system hit North America. According to Jaffe, work on Twisted Metal began in 1993, presumably right after he rapped on Mickey Mania, since he said in interviews that he only works on one game at a time. Jaffe and Mike Jom, his fellow producer at what was soon to become Sony Computer Entertainment of America, or SCEA, conceptualized a game based on their shared love of action movie car chases, in which the cars would not race, but simply try to destroy each other. When working with producer Scott Campbell at Salt Lake City's Single Track Studios, Jaffe fleshed out the idea, being very impressed with what that team could do with the 3D graphics on the PlayStation. Together, they likened the game to a fighting game with cars, and as such brought in a group of fighting game fans to focus test it shortly before it came out. According to Jaffe and Campbell, the focus group hated the game, and Jaffe was convinced it would be a flop possibly marking the end of his career at Sony. He could not have been more wrong. This game was a massive hit with both audiences and critics. Twisted Metal released to an audience hungry for new experiences, which of course is the norm for early adopters of new consoles, but was even more true here with the first generation of truly capable 3D hardware. The game hit first in North America on November 5th, 1995, less than two months after the system itself. It would arrive in Europe in January of 96, and in Japan over a year after its original US release the following November. The story, such as it is, concerns a man named Calypso who stages a contest called Twisted Metal every year in Los Angeles. The game takes place on Christmas Eve in the far-flung future of 2005 and the prize for winning is that Calypso will grant the victor one wish. Though he does have a certain monkey's paw style of wish granting, so contestants would be wise to word their wishes carefully. And those contestants are made up of a swath of archetypes, from homicidal clown Needles Kane driving series mascot the Sweet Tooth Ice Cream Truck, to two high school bros in a stolen monster truck, to literally the Grim Reaper. Still, the game for the most part has its tongue firmly planted in cheek. The levels are generally a bit drab, with a lot of grays and blacks and browns, with the exception of the Cyberbia stage. Also, while the game's opening and ending are just text over a photograph of Calypso, there were full motion video endings shot that can be found in full on the PS2 port of Twisted Metal head-on. And 
Honestly, they're so ridiculous, I'm a bit sad they didn't make the cut. Regardless, audiences ate up the vehicular carnage. Twisted Metal is not the first game to mix driving and machine guns. Games as old as Spy Hunter and Road Blaster did that, but near as I can tell, it was the first action game to do so with zero pretense of racing, or at the very least, moving continuously in a straightish line. And in full 3D, this game was something special. And as someone who was playing games at the time, I can confirm that. In fact, the copy I'm playing here is my sister's original 1996 copy, which we got alongside our PS1. We never played anything like this, and we loved this game. Twisted Metal was EGM's best-rated game of 1995, and fittingly went on to win their overall game of the year. And that's nothing to sneeze at. It was up against games like Chrono Trigger, Donkey Kong Country 2, and Street Fighter Alpha, among many others. Andrew Barron said in his review, So far, this is my favorite PlayStation game. And even publications that didn't give it Game of the Year honors still loved it. Game player's Mike Salmon said, There's no doubt that Twisted Metal is one of the best PlayStation games available, and a great addition to any library. Which of course raises the question, how does it hold up today? Well, I'll just say it hasn't aged as gracefully as Chrono Trigger. Twisted Metal effectively created a genre. It showed Sony could make a killer first-party game. It launched a series with entries over three generations of PlayStation hardware, plus the PSP. It is, not unlike Virtua Fighter, an important game. But playing it today, it's not an especially good game. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad. But I think a lot of people now, with the benefit of hindsight, would either cite the direct sequel, Twisted Metal 2 World Tour, or Twisted Metal Black on the PS2 as the high water mark of the series. And again, like Virtua Fighter, several sequels adding so much to the formula make it largely obsolete. Unless you're on a gaming history tear. This game only has six stages, and a couple aren't all that different from one another. It does have 12 cars, which would be increased in sequels, but not dramatically. Ultimately, it's refined gameplay, better and brighter graphics, more variety in terms of items and character-specific special weapons, and in my opinion the biggest factor, co-op, that make the sequels much more enjoyable. This original game has a two-player mode, yes, but it's strictly one-on-one -on -one deathmatch, while later games let you and a friend take on the whole contest. Unfortunately, I cannot allow myself to get bogged down in discussing the history of the entire Twisted Metal series, or this episode will end up being like an hour long. But I will say that I would like to talk more in depth about Twisted Metal 2 at some point in the future. At any rate, we are now moving on to the other end of the Twisted Metal saga, the final, at least as of right now, entry in the series. Released on Valentine's Day in 2012, it's Twisted Metal on the PlayStation 3. This game had a semi-troubled development, apparently intended to be launched almost entirely as an online multiplayer game, but partway through development, a single-player campaign, well, three of them to be exact, were added. This game changes things up a bit, with each campaign being the story of one character, Sweet Tooth, Mr. Grimm, who is no longer the literal Grim Reaper, and Dollface, and each of them has the option to choose from a variety of vehicles, up to 17 when all's said and done, including a helicopter. This time the game was made by Eat Sleep Play, a company formed by Jaffe and Campbell that Sony had tapped for Twisted Metal's return. They had worked on Black for the PS2, and oddly enough, Small Brawl on the PS1 after 989 Studios took over for Twisted Metal 3 and 4, but that was with Campbell's prior company, Incognito. The first game from Eat Sleep Play was actually the PS2 port of Twisted Metal Head On, and Twisted Metal on PS3 was Eat Sleep Play's first fully original game. This is one of the two M-rated Twisted Metal games, and I don't love that. Not necessarily just that it's M-rated, 
but that it gets there by cranking up the grim dark edginess. And for a series of games about cars with machine guns mounted on the hood, a story that puts you in the shoes of a serial killer whose sole wish is to murder his own daughter just feels like a bit much, you know? A little too try hard, if you ask me. Twisted Metal Black is like this too, and while it doesn't affect my enjoyment of the games, it still feels a bit unnecessary. Still, all that said, this game is really fun. I wasn't able to get an online game going since the servers came down last year, but the single player really has everything that makes for a good Twisted Metal game. A lot of cars, a lot of big maps, some new modes like the cage match which require you to stay in a certain part of the map or start losing health, and even an actual race. I'm glad the race is limited to just one map, at least in the single player, but I still think it's a cool addition. The game has a largely licensed soundtrack, featuring songs like Cold Metal by Iggy Pop and, of course, Dragula by Rob Zombie. Though by the time this game came out, putting that song in a game was almost more of a throwback. And quite frankly, I like that song and the album it came from, so it's all good with me. I guess you could put it down to nostalgia, but I wouldn't put this one on the level of Twisted Metal 2. I think it has more to do with the lack of Mr. Slam than nostalgia, but either way, this one is still a top tier Twisted Metal, and much better than 3 or 4. I'd probably even put it above Twisted Metal Black if I'm being honest, but it's also been quite a while since I played that particular entry. And what of David Jaffe? Well, following the release of the original Twisted Metal, he continued to work at SCEA, and became a very well-known name when he designed the first God of War on the PS2. When he left Sony to start his own shop, Eat Sleep Play, it didn't last long, and he departed there shortly after Twisted Metal's 2012 release to start a different studio, which only released one game, Drawn to Death. He hasn't made a game since, and doesn't seem to have anything planned currently, though he is fairly visible on Twitter and his personal YouTube channel. As for Twisted Metal, in a video posted to the aforementioned personal YouTube channel in 2018, Jaffe said he has no knowledge of anything currently in the works for the series, and doesn't find it likely that another one is coming anytime soon. While a revival is never out of the question for Sony, they own the IP of course, I'd be surprised to see anything soon. And that's too bad, because again, this is one of the defining franchises of the original PlayStation. To go from five installments on the PS1, to two installments on the PS2, to one installment on the PS3, to none installments on the PS4, is a bummer. But at least, if the series never does come back again, it was a pretty high note to go out on. So with that, let's do like we always do and take a look and a listen side by side. It's not really a contest here, of course. The PS3 is considerably more powerful than the PS1. This is especially apparent since the original game was a very early title for the first PlayStation, and the 2012 game came out six years after its platform debuted, meaning the devs had a much better handle on the hardware. Still, as someone who was there, those 1995 graphics were incredible to see running on a home system 25 years ago. And that makes it time to give the edge. And while the PS1 game is definitely 
absolutely far and away the more important game. The PS3 game is the one that I would actually recommend you play if you want to enjoy some car combat these days. And if you want to check them both out, they're actually fairly cheap and pretty available if you have a PS3. They're both available to download on the PlayStation Network for the PlayStation 3. This one also playable, of course, on the Vita and the PSP, because it's a PS1 classic. Uh, but six bucks and 10 bucks respectively, or you can get them both in a bundle along with Twisted Metal 2 and Black for 30 bucks. If you want physical copies, they're also not too bad. You can get either one of these complete for less than $20 in the current market. Although, if you actually want a long box copy of this one, that's gonna drive the price up closer to 50. I don't think it's worth it. Again, this is just uh, my sister's original copy from 1996, so it's the one I have. And that would normally be it. But, like I said, we're just at the beginning of this PlayStation celebration, so let's take a minute and talk about what was coming next for the PS1. As 1995 drew to a close, the system was already a huge success. The same issue of Game Players that reviewed Twisted Metal, the 1996 January issue, which likely went to press in November of 1995 given how magazine cycles were in those days, reported that Sony had already moved 300,000 PS1s and 1 million games in the United States, with Toshinden and Ridge Racer having a nearly 100% attach rate. Sega had already begun their self-sabotage outside of Japan, and Nintendo's biggest failure, the Virtual Boy, was their latest retail product. The video game world was Sony's oyster. And we'll pick up the story there and talk about one of Sony's most important early third-party partners next time. See you then. Hey folks, it's Joe. Thanks so much for watching. First of all, I want to give shoutouts to Greg Seward of Generation 16 for providing the voice of Tom Kalinske, as well as Danny and Alex of Retro Pals for providing the voices of EGM and game players. All those dudes are great, and links to their channels are in the description. If you liked what you saw, please share it, like it, leave a comment below telling me your favorite Twisted Metal vehicle, and of course, if you really liked it, consider supporting via YouTube membership or Patreon, which will get you early access to new videos, your name here with all these cool people, and more. Or check the description for links to merch sales, as well as affiliate links to small businesses that I also personally shop at. If you want more PlayStation talk from me, the link to the PlayStation Celebration playlist is on the left, and the link to my Toshinden video is on the right.